very happy to introduce you to the 2022 lectureship. Uh, but before I introduce our honored lecturer this afternoon, I'd like to just say just a few words about Doc Lewis and who he was. Uh, Warren K. Lewis was affectionately known by his students and associates as Doc Lewis and had an enormous impact on shaping this chemical engineering program and the field of chemical engineering as a whole. He received his PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Breslau, Germany in 1908, and he joined MIT as an assistant professor in 1910. He ultimately was promoted to professor in 1914, and he was the first head of the newly formed chemical engineering department after it fully separated from chemistry and served as department head from 1920 to 1929. After this, uh, Dr. Lewis devoted himself to teaching, research, and consulting, and remained an influential member of the department until his death in 1975 at the age of 92. Now, Lewis revolutionized the design of chemical engineering equipment with the concept of unit operations, the first paradigm of chemical engineering. He was an eminent researcher and inventor, and he contributed much to the field of industrial chemistry with over 80 patents to his credit. For example, he pioneered the use of fluidized bed catalytic cracking and refining. Now, above all, Doc Lewis was a superb educator. His text, Principles of Chemical Engineering, with Walker and McAdams in 1923, first defined the discipline. His lectures are legendary for the combination of beautifully organized material and the way that he would engage in these Socratic exchanges with students. And you can kind of see examples of this in this picture here, with the hands waving, really engaging and asking difficult questions. Not surprisingly, Lewis won many awards, among them the President's Medal of Science, the President's Medal of Merit, and the Priestly Medal from the ACS. As a most fitting honor, our professional society, the AICHE, has honored him with the creation of the Warren K. Lewis Award, which recognizes outstanding education in chemical engineering. The Warren K. Lewis Lectureship was established at MIT in 1978 to recognize Professor Lewis's revolutionary impact on chemical engineering. By developing the concept of unit operations, first proposed by A.D. Little and William Walker, he revolutionized the design of chemical engineering processes and equipment. Throughout his career, Professor Lewis was mindful of the needs of industrial practice. Accordingly, the Lewis Lecture features speakers from industry and academia. Now, I am very excited to introduce our speaker, Dr. Nubar Fan, the Warren K. Lewis Lecturer, um, and uh, CEO of Flagship Pioneering, a company that conceives, creates, resources, and develops first-in-category bioplatform companies to transform human health and sustainability. An entrepreneur, founder, and biochemical engineer, a fan holds more than 100 patents and has co-founded and helped build more than 70 life science and technology startups during his 33-year career. He is co-founder and chairman of the board of Moderna, Omega Therapeutics, and uh, Generate Biomedicines, Tessera Therapeutics, and Laurent. He is also co-founder and board member of Rubius Therapeutics, Your BioHealth, and Kodiak and Denali are also flagship companies. Dr. Fayon is a member of the MIT Corporation, that is MIT's governing board, and a member of the Board of Trustees for the Boston Symphony Orchestra, which is a very interesting, must be a very interesting position. Now, I've had the pleasure of introducing Nubar multiple times, and I always use the same pictures. So I decided to mix things up a little bit because he has such an interesting life. I want to start by mentioning that Nubar was born in Beirut in, to Armenian parents in 1962. And this is a picture from, I believe, 1975 as a young man. Uh, he and his family moved to Canada, and his undergraduate work was at McGill University in Montreal. Ultimately, Nubar came to MIT Chemie and completed his PhD in biochemical engineering in 1987. He worked in the lab of Professor Daniel I. C. Wong, one of the original shapers of the field of biochemical engineering. Nubar has written numerous scientific publications and is the inventor of over 100 patents. He was a senior lecturer at MIT Sloan School of Management from 2000 to 2016 and a lecturer at Harvard Business School until 2020. Um, he teaches and speaks around the world on topics 
ranging from entrepreneurship, innovation, and economic development to biological engineering, new medicines, and renewable energy. He truly bridges the academic and industrial realm. Now, uh, here you can see that he has continuously held a role in the presence of the field and enabled translation of biochemical engineering concepts. He's pictured in his early entrepreneurial days uh, with his former PhD advisor, Daniel I.C. Wan, and uh, Professor Phil Sharp, who are two uh, amazing legends in biochemical engineering and biology and its translation. And Nubar is a large part of that generation of the biotechnology field uh, and certainly uh, impacted this region. Now, as mentioned previously through flagship pioneering, he launched landmark companies such as Moderna, which have had a great impact on the world with its mRNA COVID vaccine. Prior to founding flagship, Nubar was an entrepreneur uh, and then founded Perceptive Biosystems, a leader in bioinstrumentation that grew to $100 million in annual revenues. After Perceptive's acquisition by Perkin Elmer at Polera Corporation in 1998, he became Senior Vice President and Chief Business Officer of Aplera, where he initiated and oversaw the creation of Solera Genomics. These are all things that I get to talk to Nubar about a lot. However, we don't get to talk as much about uh, another part of Nubar, which is that he's a passionate advocate of the contributions of immigrants to economic and scientific progress. Nubar received the Golden Door Award in 2017 from the International Institute of New England in honor of his outstanding contributions to American society as a UN U.S. citizen of foreign birth. He was also awarded a great immigrant honor from the Carnegie Corporation in 2016 received a Technology Pioneer Award from the World Economic Forum in 2012, and was presented with the Ellis Island Medal of Honor in 2008. Of course, on top of all of this, I'd like to separately congratulate Nubar on being elected to the National Academy of Engineering, the topmost honor of an engineer in the U.S. Now, together with his partners, a fan has launched and supported several philanthropic projects, including the IDEA Foundation, UWI, UWC, Dillijohn School, FAST, and the Aurora Prize for Awakening Humanity to raise awareness of the world's most pressing humanitarian problems. Previously, he was a co-founder and board member of the National Competitiveness Foundation of Armenia, a private-public partnership dedicated to promoting economic development in the former Soviet Republic of Armenia. And what we show here is what a star Nubar is, uh, next to George Clooney and uh, his two co-founders, uh, of the 100 Lives Initiative. Uh, this is at an event to express gratitude to the individuals and institutions whose heroic actions saved Armenian lives during the genocide 100 years ago. This was held uh, in New York City. Uh, during the event, the group reiterated the need to combat genocide and advance human rights efforts. So Nuvar, it is a real pleasure to introduce you, and now we're going to hear about emergent discovery. Well, thanks, thanks for the introduction. That was a long introduction, and I'm sorry for all of you to have to listen to it. Um, there's three things you can take away from it. One, that I'm old and getting older. Um, I was sitting in your seats some 39 years ago for the first time when I came to MIT in 1983, and have been doing the kind of things that were described uh, for 35 years since I graduated. The second is that I have attention deficit order, not disorder. Um, you know, that, that is that, like many, many of you, um, you know, and like many people at MIT, I, I like trying to do many different things and many too many things. And so over time, they accumulate. So I, that's, that's, that's that. And then the third is that you can't be sitting where you're sitting and be part of MIT and not walk away with a sense of burden to do something important in the world. And when I was here, I remember now I actually looked up who were the uh, Lewis lecturers when I was a graduate student, and I remember distinctly one of them was the then CEO and chairman of DuPont. Jefferson was his last name, Edward Jefferson. And I remember over the period of two, three years seeing CEOs of DuPont and Shell at the time, these you know, huge, venerable chemical, biochem not plastics companies and petrochemicals, come in and talk about what they were doing. And in some small way, if some subset of you today kind of walk away feeling burdened, 
which is the way I felt when I left here, I think that'll be a good thing. So that's what I'm going to try to do today, is to burden you. Um, so, I, you know, obviously, I don't know who's in the audience, so I don't know how much to focus just on engineering and science, how much on innovation and its impact in the world. So it's going to be a hybrid talk. I'm going to start out telling you how, how it is we do what we do, just some of our thinking process, and then I'll use some examples uh, some examples of platforms that we've developed and are developing currently, hoping to exemplify them, but also to show you where we think some of the cutting edge in this field are, uh, is going. So, let's see if this thing is going to work here. All right. So, let me start at a, at a very, very high level and talk about broadly breakthrough innovation. Um, so, of course, we know about innovation, which is just making something that is better, useful, that people are willing to consume in some way. But breakthrough innovation, when we use that designation, you know, we usually are referring to things that are, let's say, discontinuous. So things that are not just another iteration of something, but it's a major advance. You know, there's lots of different ways people describe it. And usually these things stem from major new discoveries and science and technology and, and, and uh, kind of you know, some heroic actions, and so there's, it's, there's a lot of kind of, uh, um, kind of mystery around how this works. And since it's meant to be highly rare, elusive, hard to predict, people basically look for these things by placing a lot of bets on a lot of things, figuring that at some low frequency they're going to make a hit. This is the shots on goal strategy. And investors do that. Uh, large pharmaceutical companies largely do that in the way they think about drug development. These are a lot of shots on goal. Uh, now, you know, we were, we're trained as scientists, engineers, and this notion of shots on goal kind of almost approximates a lottery was always really offensive to me. But, but it is what you do if you think that your, your chance of any one shot going in is so low that you just have to take lots of shots on goal. And I say that in a context of how we're trying to operate, and I'll kind of tell you a little bit the difference. So, when we set out to create flagship pioneering back in uh, 2000, yeah, 99, 2000, excuse me, our goal was to see whether we could systematically create breakthrough innovations and also systematically create companies around breakthrough innovations. Now, when I use the word systematically, what I mean by that is following a process, follow, using a team, the same team, over and over again. And of course, we were told then, and it's largely true now, that most people believe that, that both of those things, making breakthrough innovations and starting companies that have impact, are rare things and therefore cannot be made systematic. And that was an interesting challenge to us because it's, you know, why work on things that everybody believes can be done? And so we started saying, okay, well, if you believe you can do it, how would you do it? So that's what I'm going to try to tell you in the next couple of slides. So the first thing we, we tried to think about is where do you innovate? And this is a very simplistic diagram, but just think about a little bit kind of what the point I'm trying to make here. So if you look at this, you see, I don't even know if this thing is going to work. But I haven't used the pointer for at least three years because we don't have physical presentations, so this is fun. All right, so if you look at this circle, what I'm trying to show is in any given field, you can take everything that's known, everything that's been done, and call it current solution space, and that's what the gray inner circle is. Now, what, in, in also little gray dots, I'm showing you where I believe most of the incumbent innovations happen. That is the large dominant companies in an area. They innovate within the space. That's what's called niche innovations. That is, they're filling in slots that nobody's taken, so kind of they know that somebody needs a blue one of these or a purple one of these. Or, so there's a kind of an element of this that really favors the, 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 the folks that own the market. But also they place some bets outside the, the, this uh, uh, circle, and, and they try to diversify the bets, so they place multiple shots on goal. And at, over some period of time in this adjacency zone, there'll be some progress, and some of these will cause an advance, and hopefully this little circle will protrude out here, now that's known, et cetera. Does that make sense? So the, the, the blue, the, 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 the blue dots here are, is, is where mostly, I'd say, the rest of innovation happens. And, and why, why am I drawing it this way? Well, I would say that if you look at how people make even grants that are made, you know, NIH grants or venture capital investments, 
a lot of them are clustering around what's known or what's already done. And the reason for that is that people go to experts to decide whether something's gonna work or not, or whether something's a good idea or not. And what they hear back are things that are, by definition, within some proximal zone. Otherwise, it's really hard to figure out that something is gonna work or is a good idea. So I would make the case, just to kind of set the stage, that this zone of adjacency is the zone over which experts or non-experts, but mostly experts, are willing to apply their view of reasonableness, their view of risk reward. And at some distance from that, you can no longer say whether this thing out here is a good idea or not. It's highly speculative. That's what people, if they want to be nice to you, uh, call it, it's too early. It's not really based on fact, etc. That's completely true. And so now the question for us was, if you wanted to, what's the likelihood that there's breakthrough innovations available here? That's a finite likelihood, low chance, because this has been picked over a lot before you got there, and it's going to be picked over while you're there, because everybody is there. What's the chance that out here you could make breakthrough innovations? Well, I can't prove to you that it's higher, but it's less picked over. It's just not something that people have yet gotten around to doing. So my simple point is, can you operate at, to innovate way outside the zone of adjacency? Or what I would call, can you make leaps, right? So now the problem becomes, who's going to pay you to do that? Who's going to give you money to do that? Really hard problem. Uh, why would people risk their careers, their, their you know, very important degrees from important institutions working on these things, as opposed to something that is pretty likely going to work, and then you get on to the next one and the next one? And I try to make a list of arguments why you may want to make leaps. By the way, all of us want to make leaps. I get that. It's just that we don't really get a chance to do that with money that's available to fund those leaps. That's the argument that I'm making. So there are reasons to do it. I think they're self-evident. But it turns out there's a much, much stronger reason not to do it. And, and, and that's because one of the interesting things is you really have nothing to go by. You have no idea if you're in the middle of nowhere. Think of it like fishing in the middle of the ocean. You know there's fish in the ocean, you just don't know it's there. And it just seems like you're an arbitrary place. Why should there be value there, right? Now, I explained a simple thought to you in a very complicated way, but bear with me and I'll tell you why. So, however, if you insist that this is where you want to operate, then you got to think through, how can I operate there systematically, right? As opposed to just hoping that there's value. And that's what we tried to think through in the early days of our adventure. And the closest idea we could kind of use, we didn't come up with this idea, this was, this was preceded long ago, but it not as much applied to this notion of innovation is nothing short of Darwinian evolution. And by that I mean simply the operators of variation, selection, and iteration. Right? Now, we know that in nature, that creates immense complexity uh, in the parts and in the whole, that it, because of nonlinear uh, effects of the func uh, end function of the component parts, recombination, let alone mutation, can create massive diversity of function. And therefore, we can explain through a series of descendancies of a retained uh, uh, advantage how it is that something useful can come about under selection pressure. I'm describing something that's well known to all of you. But the question is, can we just do this as a way to leap and discover something worth doing, right? And that's, that's the, that's, this is the process we've used for the last 22 years to develop all of our companies. And none of our companies, especially in the last decade plus, have come about based on a breakthrough advance followed by its application in products, but rather we use this approach to anticipate and to basically iterate around a leap after which we could see if we could find something worth doing. And I'm gonna give you some example. So this is a, a diagram trying to show you a process we use to give you a sense of scale. There's about 100 PhDs, MDs in science, engineering in PhDs that work within our labs, flagship labs, and they practice this, right? They're not doing research. They're not looking for interesting new findings to try to use, see, use out of, but they're actually practicing this type of approach. So let me explain it in a nutshell. There's only one or two more of these, and then I'll get some examples. So uh, in order to wake you up or shock you in your seat, I'm gonna tell you that everything we do starts with our imagination, right? You're in a school where 
and every other school, but MIT is a little bit of a blend, where reasoning skills, knowledge skills, all of that dominate. Imagination, not so much. I mean, in arts, maybe. But I'm going to argue to you that the most important faculty to actually innovate with is just flat out imagination. And the more experience you get in, in, in life, the more your imagination actually is useful because it's constrained by some understanding but allows you to defy that and, and, and get into some unreasonable places. So I call these leaps of faith. Bet you didn't think you're going to hear about faith in this talk. And I'm not talking about faith from the religious standpoint, but I just mean leaps of faith. And I took the time not too long ago, because I had to give a talk, ironically, quite ironically, in the Vatican about science. And one of the things you realize is the definition of faith, which I had never looked up. Anybody in the room look it up? I know we're not supposed to do this as a Q&A, but I'll ask you anyway. Anybody want to guess? Go ahead. Believing in things you can't see. Believing in things you can't see. More generally, belief without facts. That's faith. That's the definition of the dictionary. Belief without facts, right? And so what's wrong with that? If you can believe without facts and then go get facts to support the belief, then the facts will dictate things that other people don't have to have faith to do. But then, by then, it's too late, because if it's valuable, you brought it to life. Or you could wait for facts to accumulate before forming a belief. Like, now, we're trained to only predicate our beliefs based on facts. But if the facts come a bit later, and they reinforce your belief, the one advantage you have is that you, based on that belief, can be there a lot earlier. That's why we call this activity pioneering. I just want you to at least think about it. And it's just, it's not a better, it's just different. It's just a different way of prosecuting things. So this is literally, I'll give you examples. So this is what, what we do. We make leaps of faith or in an organized way in teams of two, three, four people all year long, some hundred of them. And they leap to any number of completely kind of uh, uh, imaginary things. I'll give you an example uh, from, a, from a couple years ago, just very briefly. We start, so we worked very early on, like some 15 years ago, on what became known as the microbiome, the human gut microbiome. Turns out that back in 97 was the first time some, some folks at, in WashU started sequencing uh, the gut microbes only to find the kind of diversity that nobody before that, a year before that, had any idea exist in our guts. And so people got interested and we very early on started thinking, okay, what could this lead to? And we started a few different companies in this area. So we know about the human gut microbes, and we know that these are commensal organisms. And moreover, if you go look at insects, there are many insects in which microbes are, are basically obligate symbionts. You cannot, they cannot live, the insect can't live without them. By the way, humans can't either in our gut. Vice versa, the, the microbe can't live without the host. It's just this absolute merger of the life forms. So you might say, okay, what does this have to do with the, the next leap? So from there, would you be willing to conjecture, as we did six years ago, that there must be commensal viruses. Now, those of you who worked in this field, you'll say, of course, they are integrated into the human genome. We have these herbs. We know where to find them. I'm not talking about integrated viruses from the past. I'm talking about current commensal viruses, right? So we went around and started asking people, are there commensal viruses that, are, that colonize the body? And by and large, people said, no. But viruses are pathogenic, as though they were like born to be pathogenic. But turns out that Pathogenic viruses are the only ones who get any funding to be worked on. Not that there's only pathogenic viruses. So if you are willing to just make a leap of faith that there must be viruses that are actually not eliminated by the immune system, then what would you do? You'd go look for them. You'd say, okay, suspend this belief for a minute. I don't need to find a paper that says this exists before I start working on it. Just start asking the question, where would they be? So our team went and looked at a lot of bioinformatics uh, you know, analyses, and you could, of course, in very quickly find that there's tons of DNA that does not fit the canonical human genome sequence. And that's usually excluded from the consensus sequences that are made. But if you look at the subset of them, they, boy, do they look like viruses. And people thought, well, maybe it's just kind of parts and bits and pieces of viral infections you had, et cetera. Well, I'll, 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 I'll tell you the end result of this because I didn't bring slides on this particular one. What ended up happening after two, three years of this is that we found that there's a family of viruses, Aloe veridae, that had been studied in the past, and then people stopped working on them 10 years before we got there because the NIH wouldn't fund things that are not pathogenic, so they worked on them in the beginning, couldn't find what they're bad for, not what they're good for, and stopped working. 
So our team said, okay, what can you make a vector out of this? Can you, make, can you take the virus, grow it outside the body, never been done, make, figure out what the parts do, what the ORFs are, and then can you use it to deliver a gene back in the body? Why might you do that? As many of you will know, in gene therapy, lentivirus, adenosessorid virus are used. They have tons of problems with them. They are pathogenic originally, and, and the immune system doesn't like them. So you can use them once. Maybe if you wait a long time, you can use them a second time, three. But you can't continuously use them, and they're certainly not working in a way that's acceptable in the body. Long story short, if you go online nowadays, you can see, and there's some publications we put on this. There's a company called Ring Therapeutics, which has essentially converted this whole class of commensal viruses into a viral delivery vector and is looking to use it for good, which is to deliver genes repeatedly. And it's a very interesting thing because there's a huge human experiment that's already been done on this, by the way. That's the beauty when you kind of don't look at only the literature because you can say, okay, well, if this is happening, where might you find these? So I'll tell you one other thing, just so it's for your imagination. I'm trying to get your imagination to be, to be in that moment. Well, if such a thing exists, what would happen if there's blood transfusion, right? So if, 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 you are the, if you're a donor and somebody sitting next to you is the acceptor, maybe the viral sequence goes from one donor to the person who receives it. So it turns out it happens in every single blood transfusion. Not only that, you can look at the sequence from the donor and you find them in the receiver nine months later. And then you look at antibodies that we didn't have to do any experiments. In other words, you don't have to do a IND clinical trial of a gene therapy. We already know it's transmissible, but if you hadn't thought such a virus exists, you would wait for that to be shown. So that's what I mean by leaps of faith. Now, long story short, I'll, I'll accelerate. These, sorry, these um, leaps of faith lead to the creation of a set of hypotheses for value. Because at the end of the day, we're not trying to make scientific advances. We're trying to come up with things that, are, that have some way of impacting patients, some way of impacting society, and that's where value comes from. And the part I told you in the previous slide about Darwinian evolution, variation selection, basically takes these initially completely arbitrary starting points, you know, some inspiration behind them, but not much, and then does this set of iterations in order to figure out a whole lot of them, you pretty quickly figure out why it's never going to work, and you can actually do the definitive thought experiment and rule it out. But some of them survive these iterations. And those ones are the only ones that we then take forward and, and try to go into the labs and reduce to practice. And literally, we have a phase that we call a protocol, not a real company, where we, for a couple of million dollars, nine months or so, try to kill the idea experimentally. Nothing up here is experimental. This is experimental. And if it fails to die, it becomes a company. And that's, those are the companies that we've created over the years, and those are the companies, some subset of which grow. So if you look at what we do today as a process, you know, chemical engineering process, if you want, this is the logic of what we do. These are the products that we create from our labs. They're companies. They're not drugs. They're not agriculture products. They're actually companies as the product. And if you go from left to right, you see these explorations. They lead to these protocols. You'll notice they're numbered, a bit of a nod to MIT. But as well, they're numbered because it turns out it's really easy to kill a number. You go try to kill a really well-named company. It's very sad. You know, but a number, you know, who cares if FL87 made it or not? So we keep these numbers for quite a while until we actually can do the definitive experiments to at least indicate that where we leapt to and where we discovered around there is worth pursuing. And then they eventually emerge, and then eventually they come out here where they become growth companies. And what you see on the outside of this kind of uh, uh, membrane, if you will, companies uh, just outside our universe are companies that are now public. The aggregate kind of uh, uh, employee base around all of this activity, most 95% of which is in Cambridge, is about 6,000 people. It's a little under 6,000 people. And so this is kind of what we uh, have developed over the last couple of decades. So one example of this is a, a company called Moderna, which is LS18, the 18th such thing that we did. So I'm going to tell you about that, both as an instance of this, but also as a kind of a, a more specific example of what a new platform looks like. I use the word platform a little bit, but let me just explain what I mean by that. If you're going to make a leap of faith, land in a place, iterate, iterate, iterate until you come up with something worth testing, test it. One of the things we concluded, maybe we're wrong about this, is that you're better off developing a whole suite of capabilities instead of just one specific product out of that whole process. Why? 
Because getting right the fact that the one thing works with human physiology and a drug and a disease is a very different thing than if you can come up with a suite of products. So what we think about as platforms is we like thinking of inventing things that eventually can generate many, many products. And that's what we set out to do with LS18. In LS18, the question, the what if question in the beginning was, what if you could introduce compounds into the body that cause the body to make its own drugs? That was the original kind of conception that when we ran into work that was being done, whether it was with DNA or mRNA around that time, it was not to make drugs, but we realized that, that, that those are the molecules you're going to use. You're going to use an information molecule if you're going to try to do some kind of coding in the body. Well, that starting point, which was summer of 2010, literally May of 2010, led to what exists today, and I'm going to fill the blanks a little bit to you, which is a company that currently has 46 uh, drugs in development, uh, some 27 of them in human clinical studies, uh, and the other ones are within a year, otherwise they wouldn't be considered a, a program, for formal development programs. And let me tell you kind of briefly what this does. Now, of course, you know, this used to be a more interesting story than when everything from Sports Illustrated to Vogue started talking about mRNA and, and vaccines and all that, but I'm going to tell you some things that I, that I suspect you haven't heard yet. So, I think we, we all know this kind of dogma, central dogma of biology, which is how information kind of uh, moves from DNA all the way to a functional protein. And our basic idea, going back 12 years when we started kind of literally hypothesizing that this could even be done, was that we would somehow get the RNA that we were interested in coding for a protein. Think of it as a plasmid, except in the form of an RNA, but also a plasmid that's not going to persist very long, uh, into the cell, and then we would essentially use the cell's own operating system, that is the ribosome doing the translation, to make proteins that, based on their sequence uh, and, uh, and, and information we could encode in it, could go to where we wanted it to go and do any number of things. In fact, our original goal was to make any protein this way, every protein this way, through an external safe way of getting the code in, right? So some years later, we can look back and say, it turns, you know, what does it take to do this? If, you, if this was 2010 and you started thinking, well, why aren't there information molecules that we're using? Why is it that by that time, biotechnology, 30 years in its making, had basically concluded that you would use Chinese hamster ovaries or other such cells, industrially hardened, in very carefully controlled reactors. Professor Cooney is here, and at the time I was a graduate student, that was the frontier of research, was how are you going to grow mammalian cells in a way that doesn't kill them to make these very sophisticated proteins. But now you build a factory that's, you know, a billion dollars plus. It can make one and only one protein. Whether you know it's going to work or not, you have to build a factory, and then if it doesn't work, then you try to figure out what to do. This is very, very laborious, costly thing. And every, pretty much every cell in your body, maybe with the exception of red blood cells, knows how to do exactly that same thing and does it every day, all day long. But we don't use any of that, right? So the question was, could you do this using this information power and the fact that cells have this ubiquitous or common operating system? So it turns out you need several things to happen, and I'm going to just really fly through this now in the interest of time. You need to be able to not only design this, but you need to be able to make a lot of this mRNA. At the time, mRNA had been made at the level of micrograms because it was a reagent that was used in laboratories. And so you, you know, it's not very straightforward as to how you make a relatively large molecule. People had made little bits of RNA, inhibiting RNA, antisense, but they had not made full intact mRNA. And so you need to have, imagine, at least in the first phase, you don't have to show that this thing works in order to imagine it's scalable. If it's not scalable, you'd rather not work on it. So one of the early questions you have to ask yourself is, how am I going to make it? How am I going to make a lot of it? And if I can't, why am I working on it? Right? So that's one question we had to ask. A second question is, huge question is, why hasn't anybody done this? And you've, you know, one or two Google searches later, you realize that in the 80s, people did try to do this, including Genentech. And what they found is that if you stick a piece of mRNA into a mammalian cell, all hell breaks loose. Because the cell's innate immune sensors think that it's some kind of an invading virus, and they essentially respond with interferon and cytokines and all sorts of changes. Protein expression goes down. And so it basically reacts to it like it's, it's a viral infection. Well, at the time in 2010, we knew that much, but we had no idea what is the mechanism, what are the sensors. 
People knew there's toll receptors, but nobody knew what single-stranded mRNA was being detected by, let alone whether you could suppress it, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it frees the moment. What do you do? If you are willing to leap, you say, good, keep notes. We're going to have to buy some more toilet paper or some more. In other words, I got to fix that problem. But it's not a reason to give up. Because if you want to solve it, that's where the engineering mindset comes. Now that's a problem worth solving. It's just not a problem anybody else has worked on solving because they weren't interested in the opportunity because it was not proximal scientifically. I hope that's, that's the point I'm trying to get across. So innate immune response, a very important thing. Delivery, very important. I'm going to skip through these pretty quickly. So delivery, we knew, right? So what cells do you want to get this into? You want to get it into your liver? Why in the liver? Well, it turns out it's easy to get things into the liver, so people just started working on the liver. But you'd like to get it in, if you could, to the brain, you could to the heart muscles, you could, you could get to any number of cells. We had no idea how to do that. Again, a really good reason to say, I'm going to come back to this in a decade. Or you could say, okay, well, if I get it to one type of cell and establish that can be done, I'll be the first to do the other cells. And that's kind of the route that we took. All right, so let me accelerate uh, here, and let me see, make sure I know what time it is. Okay, so as you've all heard, LMP, which was work that was being done here and many other places, but, but Bob, Bob Langer's group uh, at MIT was working on LMPs for many years, turned out to have been used for small RNA, and so it was the most logical thing to try to use for this type of mRNA. It's, it itself is a pretty complex uh, multi-lipid polymeric system, and so you knew that you could just kind of take that chemical diversity space and kind of by combinatorially changing the variable see if you can do a lot better than what had been done. We said, okay, we know we can do that. We hadn't done it in the beginning. And I'll come back to this in a minute. The other thing you have to do is you have to say, what does this mRNA look like? We know that there's a cap, there's a tail on RNA, the sequence, there's a pre-mRNA in nature. So you've got the starting parts, but then how are you going to optimize? No idea. How do you code on optimize? By the way, as you may know, the, the, the utilization of codons in your different cells in your body based on tRNA pools are completely different. So can you optimize, if you want to get it to the liver, by using certain codons? Another area. So like I've given you five, six scientific areas of exploration, all of which you have to take on to do one of these things. But each one of them, you could imagine the first two, three steps you could do it. And that's kind of what, what it took to do this particular journey. How do you optimize? How do you model this? Okay, let me kind of abstract very quickly. What, what, what have I just described to you? Between 2010 and 2019, all of these four major areas were the subject of some eventually seven, 800 people in labs in Cambridge, just literally a block away from here, uh, working on to create every aspect of this platform. How are you going to make it? How are you going to design it? How are you going to deliver it? How are you going to avoid the immune system, uh, innate immune system, all of it? And we needed to make it for not one protein, but several thousand, because we didn't know whether this was something that would only rarely work, with many, many different types of particles. And the thing that's kind of uh, intimidating about it, in hindsight, is that we spent some one and a half billion dollars of R&D privately in a company developing this platform. And then COVID struck, right? Now, before then, which is important to also keep in mind, the company had entered clinical trials with nine other vaccine uh, uh, constructs of mRNA in humans, and in nine out of nine, they had neutralizing antibodies. That's what doesn't get covered in the literature. So basically, people thought, you know, COVID, a SARS vaccine was the first thing that we worked on. It was the 10th thing that we worked on, it turns out. It's just that none of them had become a product in phase three trials, because to do a vaccine trial, historically, has taken five, sometimes eight years, and so we were marching along ever so gradually the way biotechnology works. And, and, and of course, COVID changed that. We had built a manufacturing facility in Norwood, Massachusetts. You might say, to do what? Well, it turns out, in addition to vaccines, we had been working on cancer, we had been working on cardiovascular disease, on rare diseases, and we had nine other programs in clinical testing in those areas, all phase one, early stage. One of those programs, this is kind of more of a side distraction, was a lucky break for us because it was called a cancer vaccine. So we were working quite actively in human trials to make personalized cancer vaccines. So what you do, you take a tumor from a patient, you sequence it, you use informatics to discover what you hope are neoantigens. You then take those neoantigens and you put them into a single mRNA with 30 to 50 
different neoantigens, all concatenated into a single construct. You take that with an LMP particle, you put it back in the patient within two to three weeks, and their body expresses that protein, chops it up, expresses the antigens, and you want to get an immune response against the cancer. And we had been doing this with that type of a flow through already for about a year. Well, if you just don't tell the computer that the sequence you just put in is for a virus instead of a cancer, everything else was the same. So when the virus sequence came in, which said, okay, neoantigens, in this case, we didn't have to find 35 neoantigens, we just took the spike. We knew that that was gonna be the, the vulnerable part of the virus based on historical research that had been done. Everything else, make the mRNA, put it in LMP, put it in a vial, get it into a patient, we knew we could do in two weeks. So in, in a funny way, it looked like there was some amazing last minute rush things that were done, but if you have a platform, you can use it in a very interesting way. So let me skip ahead here. So this is kind of the journey from January 2020 till the present. I think you all know this, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip it. I'm happy to take questions at the end. Um, it took two days to go from the sequence. It, it really took two hours, but it took two days, we say, to go from sequence to the mRNA construct, the very one that enters into some of your arms. And we haven't changed anything since then. The LMP we used, we had in the beginning, because we had optimized over many years. And then we did a phase one trial. It took a couple of months to do it with great collaborators at NIH. And then, and then uh, we scaled it up. The scale up is a whole nother discussion, which, you know, that could be, that's more traditional kind of, a lot of chemical engineering kind of activities went into that, a lot of modeling, the fluid dynamics of actually mixing the RNA construct and the, and, the, and the particles or kind of forming the particles around them turns out to have a lot of very interesting optimization capabilities. We had fortunately done all that work. Plus the stability, how do you stabilize these things for storage? There's a lot of work that was done that is more traditional kind of uh, um, chemical technologies. And let me skip ahead here. Where are we? Because I just realized I went way too much detail. So let me, let me zoom back out and say uh, this is kind of a leap of faith followed by a bunch of killer questions, followed by proofs that you can actually potentially do this, and then a 10-year overnight journey to be able to get to a place where you have a platform that you could apply to what the vaccine was made of. We had made several thousand doses of anything before 2020. In 2020, we made 800 million doses of this single RNA vaccine. An interesting data point just in the history of biotechnology is that in my estimation, there's more RNA-based drugs, biotherapeutics, I'm gonna call it, that have entered human beings than all the proteins that existed in the previous 35 years. If you just look at the numbers, there's now two billion people that have received mRNA vaccines. So it, RNA went from being a really speculative unproven kind of new kid on the block to there's a hell of a lot more of it that's been used in humans from a safety standpoint than anything else that we've done with proteins. So you have to be ready with that as to say, okay, in the next one I do, can I actually leverage that learning, let alone all the immune system learnings we've done, which is a great uh, uh, future here. All right, let me wrap up. So I had a lot more to say, but I'm, I've spent way too much time saying these things, so let me... You can ask me questions about the virus if you want later. Uh, what's gonna come out of all this? Let me just kind of fly through a couple of slides. One is we're entering a period where immune medicines and vaccines are gonna be a big beneficiary of the learnings we've done. And so one thing you can look at over the next decade or two is that what we've now learned about the, our ability to very precisely tune the immune system will be applicable in, in ways that I hope will encourage both the regulators and investors to be able to take some bolder leaps than we were willing to do before. That's why nobody ever developed vaccines in the last 20, 30 years. They're very incremental stuff because it takes take 10 years. Nobody's gonna wait that long. You know, we may, not, we may not develop one in nine months next time around, but I think as a society, we have every right to demand why we're not able to do this and should consider this possible. And so what, is that, what does that open up? So that's a space that a, a, a hell of a lot of interesting things are happening in. I'm gonna, for, forgive me, I'm gonna skip ahead. One of the exciting things that are gonna come out of that is that we realize in all this that we know a lot about B cells and some people, Professor Chakrabarty among them, but not that many people know a whole lot about T cells and the T cell uh, repertoire and the antigens and the sequence that, that forms the, the synapse, if you will, the immune synapse. So a lot of work is, is being done and will be done in my view to decode all of that 
And that's work that was already happening, but is accelerating as a result of the interest in the immune system. And of course, that affects cancer, autoimmune disease, and many, many viral diseases. Uh, a second broad category of things that will result from, from what's, hap what's happened in the last period is programmable medicines in general. I mean, you can look at mRNA as just one great example of a programmable medicine, uh, but it's not the only one. And over the last few years, what a lot of the platform work we've been doing has been to think about it in this way for many other types of information molecules. So if you go all the way upstream in DNA, not just working on gene editors, but gene writers, which is something that we've got a platform developing in in Tessera. Ring I mentioned is the commensal virus, which is able to deliver just by swapping it in a cassette, we think in a much more permissible way in the body, yet to be shown in human trials, a, a, any payload that you want from a, that, that fits into it. Omega is a epigenomic reprogramming company that's got a platform using RNA to, to change the level of many, many uh, genes at once by altering the, the kind of epigenomic state of, of DNA, again, using RNA as a delivery vector. In the RNA space, we're making a platform that is using tRNA as a drug. And the idea would be that you come in with a synthetic tRNA that in the face of a, a, a stop codon that is midstream can put in the right amino acid so that you can read through it. Then you'd be thinking, well, wait a minute, what happens if the actual stop codon out at the end? What happens if it read through that? And so the question is, turns out ribosomes, we have to do the experiment, have a very different relationship with a midstream errant stop codon than a stop codon at the end of a, of a transcript. And so based on that, we're getting some very interesting data. tRNA will be a programmable medicine, I believe, and so forth. So, and then the other, the last thing I'll just mention, and maybe in the of time to take some questions, I'll stop here. I had some more slides, but I won't use them, is, is the kind of what you've heard a lot on campus and a lot of exciting things in the interface between AI and biology, the key being that the, I believe that machine learning tools are already now allowing us to generate de novo protein designs, for example, that combine to an arbitrary DNA sequence when, when, when converted to a protein, and that you don't need to have a three-dimensional model of the protein to be able to do that, we believe. If you could train systems with enough data and enough iterative loops to do that, the question is, what, where else can you actually use these techniques to do generative biology, not explaining the, the data that you saw? And then what else could you do with these? And I actually think that in cell modeling and many other areas, these types of tools will give us yet another acceleration that we've been already enjoying for many years with new measurement techniques. So there's a lot of value to be had with that. Um, uh, this is the part I'm not going to tell you about is generate. All right. I'm going to stop here because you're probably exhausted and see if I can take questions. Thank you very much. Excellent. And just before we take questions, I would like to take a moment to present to you, Nubar, the Warren K. Lewis Lectureship Award. Thank you very much for uh, presenting for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Absolutely. And now we will take questions from the audience. And we have two microphones. We are live streaming, so it would be great if, if you can reach a microphone. And if you need help, we can. If we can, I'll repeat your question. So, fire away. This is a nice talk, uh, no part. So, I agree with um, this leap of faith business. I can tell you that not only in my life, but other people's lives, um, the most interesting things sometimes people do are when they, at least in academia, when they completely switch fields, which requires a leap of faith because you have no facts to back up that you can contribute to this field, okay? It's very hard. All the challenges you wrote are multiplied in academia for reasons you mentioned. So it requires really not intelligence, but courage. So what, if you were made the czar of science and engineering in the US, what policy changes would you make such that you didn't require inordinate courage in academia to be able to do it? You've solved that problem within flagship, but how would you solve it in such an environment? Mm. You may not be interested in the answer to this question, but mm. many people here are. So. Um, well, so I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the question. So 
I think, I think there's a bunch of different places where this is um, root, kind of rooted out, I would say, this type of propensity. Um, I think just even within the way uh, we, education works, we reward and, and encourage and, 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 and kind of advance people who know a lot and who can apply that knowledge uh, to solve problems, but not people who kind of are original in their thinking and are willing to be wrong in half of what they say to be valuable in the other half of what they say. So people who refuse to be wrong in what they say, I would argue, will never say something that is actually going to surprise you. But where can you, can you imagine going to a, a scientific you know, a, a conference and presenting something that contains some level of imagination not yet fully formed? They'll be laughed out of the room. They won't be invited again. So there's a cultural aspect to this, which is very hard in a, in a, in a setting like this. I don't know. Frankly, Arup, how you give tenure to people who want to be imaginative as opposed to consistently productive. Starts, earlier. Starts even earlier, exactly. The research proposal talks that our faculty candidates, they try to do something like this? Yeah, they're killed, exactly. So right off the bat, how you get a faculty role, how you get your gra a graduate student advancing, on and on. So I, I, I believe that this is a cultural issue. We, have to, we just have to talk about it. I don't think that there's... By the way, the answer is not do this and only this. It's just do this 10% of the time, 20% of the time, or 10% of the people. Because I actually think that once you get 10% to have the, 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 the freedom to express themselves and act in this way, the other 90 are going to get jealous. But if you have zero, that's, a, that's an equilibrium, right? Because there's nobody who's offending you. By the way, Arup, I, when I was here 35, 40 years ago, there were maybe 10, 20 professors who were involved in startups. The same thing existed then. Because those people were considered completely rogue, just reality. Bob Langer, who was just like five years into his career then, he had no start startups then. But the people who did, Phil Sharp, I was pictured with, Danny Wog, you said, Charlie, these people were considered some odd academic like oddity. Now the people who don't are involved in companies kind of feel like they're a little bit odd and they feel like, what, what happened? Basically, people realize you don't have to trade off the quality of your research and your, your, your principles and your values. Just by. So I think the same with this thing. So imagination is one thing. I think how you judge, right? So if, I'm, this is being live streamed, so I'm going to be in deep trouble. But I also think that this notion that experts are the people who should decide what money goes to is a disaster. Because experts become experts by doing original things. Then they have to suppress their originality to, be, to look like experts. And then you're asking them, is this original? Well, how would they know? They actually know what they have become expert in. So I would say you need a blend of experts and non-experts reviewing grants. But if the experts are going to dominate that, I mean, if, if I recorded the last two years of experts on television describing whether a vaccine could be developed and whether it would ever work and whether 17 reasons why, and the people were publishing nonstop, I don't mean just scientific experts, epidemiologists, but, in hindsight, you could say, yeah, but it turned out that way the next time it happens, it might not. But during that period of time, there was every reason to give up, every reason. If people weren't dying, we would have long ago given up because everybody told us there's no way. They would go to the government and say, stop funding these things. This cannot work. There's going to be autoantibodies. There's going to be antibody-enhanced, drug-enhanced antibody. And we're going, how are you making this stuff up? You don't know. Do the experiment. So I think you need to think about a blend of the capital going to these two different things. You need to think about a blend of who gets to make what decisions. And I think you have to get people to realize that, uh, this is to me, I wish I was taught more about Darwinian evolution in engineering school than I was, as a concept. We, do, we call it trial and error, right? We call it like, you know, this, we used to solve problems by iterating. Well, that's a great way to create novelty, not just to solve a problem. So there's a bunch of things like that. I mean, we, we can have a long discussion about this. But I do hope and I do think that examples go a long way, too. If people believe this can be done, that's why I'm even giving a talk. Not a good one, but as, at least I'm trying to show people that this stuff can produce originality and impact. And, and, and the others, I don't know how many other examples one could find. Anyway, Charlie. Now I'm in real trouble. Charlie was on my thesis committee. Thank you, Nubar. <laughs> um, th there's, a, there's a pattern I recognized uh, in, in that um, a large portfolio of companies that, have, um, that, that, that you and others have, have really generated. And that is that they dominantly deal with treating disease. But isn't the future really in how we can learn how to prevent disease? 
And how do we take this leap of faith uh, and think about what we do to treat disease and, and flip that around mm -hmm. and really make a, a long-term uh, difference? I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm looking for my help for my grandchildren. Yes, yes. So uh, it's, it's, it's an excellent point. Um, I had to make some trade-offs in the, in the talk that I gave, but, but I recently gave a, a presentation on largely this topic. And we kind of view this, we call this preemptive medicine. So prevention, right, is a pretty high bar. And we know that vaccines, in some cases, are viewed to be preventive. And so in the public health world, this notion of prevention is practiced. By the way, you have to give it to everybody in order for, to prevent it in some people who would have otherwise gotten infected. And then in the medical world, you don't talk about prevention, you talk about treatment. Once in a while, you talk about cure, but most of the time we talk about treatment. And the question we wondered is, what about in between, right? So wouldn't it be better if we could actually intervene with disease early, that's not a new concept, or in a pre-disease state, right? And so the word I would ask you to take away from this notion is the word eradication, right? So I had to look up eradicate, just like I had to look up faith in the definition. Eradicate is from a Latin word, which means pull up from the root. Radix is root. So imagine thinking about a disease having roots. Well, you can imagine what the roots look like. Cells that are transforming that eventually become, cause colon cancer, we now know how to find. They're called polyps. And we remove them from the roots, and they don't get the disease. Pap smears allow us to intervene at a very early stage with malformations of cells. Are those cancer? Not yet. But we deal with them. But in every other case, diabetes, if there's a little bit of work in this area, NASH, hypertension, Alzheimer's, what is the pre-disease? So what we, Charlie, to your absolutely correct point, what we believe has to somehow happen. It would be a huge revolution in healthcare cost, right? If you want to be really harsh about this, think of our healthcare system. It is the best marketing word ever invented, healthcare, because we are calling sick care healthcare. It's a hell of a move, whoever came up with the word healthcare. 98% of our dollars in healthcare go to sick care, 2% go upstream of disease, and yet it's called healthcare. But if we truly wanted healthcare, we should be thinking about how do you protect health and how do you delay disease? Right? We all know that the ultimate in delay is prevention. But I'll take delay any time, right? So if I could live without cancer for another five years, I'd, I should be willing to pay a hell of a lot more for that than saving a month at the end of my life. But it's the opposite today. A month at the end of your life is 90% of the cost. So it just, this is not even what we do with our cars. We don't wait for the cars to be completely broken, only to fix them. People learned that less than a while back. I'll give you another example to think about. Our physical defense, how does our country protect us from physical uh, uh, threats, right? It's our defense department. They have big, expensive machinery, but boy, do they spend a lot of money upstream identifying threats, doing surveillance, derailing them, educating, different, moving, whatever it takes to prevent, to start with, or delay the action. These are all things that we somehow don't use for our health. So long answer is, as scientists, as engineers, as as you know, citizens, I do think that it, it's it, a more worthy life, certainly than what I've lived, would have been and would be to work on catching the roots of disease and the very first buds of disease and throwing the best minds at that. It'll save us money and it'll give people a better health span, not a better lifespan. Everybody's obsessed, especially in the West Coast, with having a long lifespan. I'd take health span over lifespan any day. But the word health span doesn't even exist. What we should do is say, how long can you be without disease? And I think that is a technology problem, that is a scientific problem, but nobody wants to work on it because people figure I'm never going to get paid because society values doing something at the end of a disease, not in the beginning. So that's a challenge back to you. I'll be back in 30 years and 40 years and listen to a talk on that. Please. I'll keep my answers shorter, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. It's really inspiring and uh, burdening to hear about your successes. Um, and I think the, the example of Moderna really is a star example of how the, the leap of faith model works. But I'm wondering if you have any 
key examples you can share about where the leap of faith didn't work and what you might have learned from those leap of faiths that did not work out? Yeah, so le you know, all leaps of faith don't work uh, in the beginning, right? And then a, a subset of them work eventually. And, and so, you know, the, it's a lot of times people, look, if it was a single step from ideation to, to realization, you could say, what percentage fail? People always tell me, and then what do you learn from the failures? But in an evolutionary sense, any given one of these is hundreds of failures on the way to something that survives at the end. And actually, I think those hundreds of failures, of all the different directions we took that didn't work, didn't work, didn't work, is itself encoded in the DNA of the thing that ultimately ends up coming out of it, like Moderna. So what I want to do is just point out to you that there are, there are things that we do that just fail in the beginning. Those are the best things we can do because we don't spend any time or money on them. Then there's things that fail really, really late. And those ones have a lot of learnings embodied in them. There's a lot of things that you learn. Among the biggest ones is actually prematurely narrowing your search space and presuming the answer, right? We are taught to, to kind of analytically reduce the search space to the most important parts and then do that. If you are in the exploratory Darwinian mindset, you should keep as much things alive for as long as you can and let the experiment run three, four, five, ten steps into it. Use the mental model of chess, right? If you have one end game in mind in the beginning of the game, <laughs> you're going to be pretty vulnerable. You want to keep a lot of end games in mind for quite a period of time and many, a lot of optionality, and then eventually it starts becoming convergent. So one example, I can give you many others, that you learn out of this is not to be prematurely convergent in what you assert is going to work. By the way, investors are, or grant makers are really problematic for that because they want you to tell them the end of the game in the beginning of the game, which disallows any kind of optionality being carried forward. Does that make sense? I, I don't, like, people often talk about strategy. If you go down, you know, to go to MBA school, stuff, you have strategy. Strategy in a pioneering setting is basically survival and at the same time trying to do the harsh experiment to figure out whether there's any of those survivors that can lead to thriving. So this duality of surviving and thriving, that's life in a new zone, right? So if you prematurely kill off the ones that would have been thriving, leaving you alive versions that are completely not valuable, that's a mistake you can't recover from. Those are one of the things that we've learned. Uh, there's one other person back there and then we'll take the front. Go ahead. Um, hi, thank you for sharing your, your thoughts on this. So uh, I have a rather specific question. So I, I wonder if you have heard of um, this new mode of therapy, supposedly called uh, targeted protein degradation, mm -hmm. or PROTEX. Um, yeah. I just want to hear uh, what, what are your thoughts on the development currently, and does the development currently fit your model of thinking? And in general, like, are you excited about it? Do you see it um, going up? Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I know about it, I'm very excited by it, and it is ubiquitously being developed in a lot, a lot of different places. And so it's, it's not, it used to be pioneering probably 15 years ago, but today it's like making anybody. It's basically everybody's going to work on it and is working on it because the people have seen proof of concept. Protax is a good example of where you don't need faith to believe because the facts exist, and so everybody's just reproducing the fact. Now you've got to worry, how do you avoid it being a commodity? And how do you extract value from it? Which is the thing that scares me the most, is you spend 10 years doing something, and then you're, it turns out you're making a commodity. But there's, there are things to be learned and done, but clearly biology, the, the essence of, of, of protein degradation, or lots of other things people are doing, is the local nature of biology. It's actually, it turns out, a chemical engineering problem, which is if you can create locally a very high concentration of the, the, the catalyst and the target such that you can use the system but to act in pretty intense ways locally. If you can create a signal that will create that, you're going to actually have a much more potent thing than if you have to pour tons of drug and just do it through binding. So there's a lot of these kind of, I'd say, local biology type of approaches, degradation being one of them, but there's other things that are happening this way as well. ADCs were an earlier version of drugs being delivered with antibodies but creating a local concentration. Then they went catalytic and so now, I think you're going to see a lot of other examples of it. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Numer. Thanks for the inspiring talk. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of the, the pioneering methodology and uh, 
I'm also, I was born in Ottawa to Lebanese parents and came to MIT for my PhD, so right. always very inspiring. Um, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's about to start a junior faculty position to apply some of this methodology in that kind of setting? Um, well, I mean, I, I, th I think you know, we talked a little earlier what you work on. I, I, by the way, I should have mentioned to one thing Arup said, which I cannot agree with more, which is change fields or subfields all the time. But let me put a finer point as to what, uh, as to why. The, I think if you have courage, and if you're an immigrant, you have a little of courage because that's what it takes to survive. But, but in any case, if you have courage, not, not confidence, courage, it's a little different thing, right? But if you have courage, then actually your competitive advantage is larger if you know less about a field. Because if you know too much about a field, one, the experts are intimidating, and two, you talk yourself out of doing things because you figure out most of the easy things have been done. But if you go into a new field, you won't know any better. And you'll ask questions that are quite unusual, and as long as you survive. Now, the thing you need to do, and I don't know how you, but you I'm sure you could do it, but practice it, is to sustain people's criticism of you, right? Like, I don't know how many of you have, have been, well, if you're at MIT, you've been criticized before, but, but how many of you enjoy it, right? But if you just for a second realize that if you think of this in an evolutionary way, if you are good at variation, the more the selection actually can, 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 can help guide the, 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 the variation, the better off you are. So when somebody tells you this is a stupid idea and here's why, you really should say thank you, but, but instead most people get devastated because they really wanted them to complement their idea. If they complement your idea, there's no information transfer. If you're in a new field, you're more likely going to accept that kind of criticism because you know that you don't know anything. In your own field, it's really hard to say things that, like, honestly, I, you know, many of the things I'm talking about today, and, and I, I've been in your involved own self -doubt. in... Sorry? Your yeah. Self-doubt. Self -doubt. Exactly. Self-doubt. Am I good enough? Am I, am I, do, why am I in this field? They're going to make fun of me. I remember a, a quick example. Years and years ago, forget viruses, we were working on human gut microbiome. I remember very clearly one day we were sitting in, in our conference room, and, and literally there was like a little plant. And, we, you know, just as by jest, I asked the question, like, are, are microbes involved in this plant? There's no, there's no soil. It's kind of like, a, you know, an office plant. I mean, there's some... And, and people said, um, yeah, in the soil, that's, that's where microbes do their thing. I said, no, no, inside the plant are there organisms. And if you go look it up, people tell you, yeah, endophytes. You know, in biology, as long as there's a name for something, people think that they kind of... But I said, okay, but is it important for the health of the plant? And people said, basically, no. I said, well, let's go talk to experts. We did talk to some experts. Pretty much all of them said that bacteria were not that important to the health of plants, let alone industrial row crops, right? So, but then if you ask them why... Or how? How is it in nature that kind of these things became sterile and you know, they no longer have any bacteria that are important to them? There's no answer to that. So you should go do the experiment. So we did that. So years ago, we said, well, what would have caused people to believe these are not important even though naturally they should be? Turns out that when plants are bred in a Mendelian way, people get rid of the bacteria because they create noise in the data. So that if bacteria are important to the phenotype, you can't get a clear signal. So if you go to seeds today that you get in a bag, in an industrial, the best seeds, they have no bacteria, basically. They've just been... Not. But in nature, if you take the seed and you sequence it, it's filled with bacteria. So what did we do? Not knowing any better, because we you know, we're not from the ag world, we took this, the bacteria from nature that in, is endogenous to these, corn, for example, soy, and we added them back in as a seed coating. And then we just ran the experiment. And in the first one or two seasons, we could show 10, 15% yield increases, drought resistance. We had no idea that that couldn't be done. And so we tried. So I think these are things, but, but again, of course, you're going to have to do enough that is conformist so that some of your time you can do things that are nonconformist and make light of it, by the way. Like this is not, you know, evolution is a bit funny, right? I mean, people, you know, think of species, you know, like the experiments don't work, they die. The, big deal. That's, that's I think, the, the lightheartedness that will allow you to innovate. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about the regulatory aspect of like a vaccine approval. Uh, that you know, when we a vaccine, when a vaccine is made, it takes a classic uh, way of getting it approved, which is going to go through clinical uh, process, and this takes, of course, the most of the time. My question is, 
what are the what are the questions that we humans need to answer to get to the point to completely change this paradigm of how the clinical approval works so we can come up with a vaccine and we know that this platform, okay, the sequence, change it, and this is the new vaccine, it's already safe, we know it. And do you anticipate that at some point the process of clinical approval gonna be significantly changed in like upcoming few decades to address this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a question of when, not whether. Uh, and, and I say that only because, so I, that's the one thing I should have told you, is another, another leap of faith mindset you wanna have is when time you see something that's completely uh, unconquerable or unimaginable, right? Just imagine, let's have this discussion and say 100 years from now, right? We come back here 100 years from now. Do you think that the FDA is gonna be regulating in exactly the same way? And I would say no, I mean, because by 100 years, you'll be able to grant me that we'll probably have good computational models of human physiology and the immune system, and we'll know every single T cell, every single, everything will be quite defined. And while there'll still be some ambiguities, within reason, we'll be able to say, yeah, we're being able to model it. So I can make an argument, and you'll probably go along with me for 100 years. Now the question becomes, okay, how about 50 years from now? And so that becomes a negotiation, right? And if you pull it, pull it, pull it, you get the answer to your question, which is, what is likely gonna have to happen first, second, third, for us to go down that path? Well, guess what? The pandemic did a huge favor to that. Because forcibly, because people were dying, they had to actually run the experiment. And what they ran, but just so you know, so there's, there's, a, there's boosters that are being used now, right? Those are, in some cases, different dose. We didn't go from, to the beginning and start all over again. There are, little known fact, in biomanufacturing, bioprocessing, changes that are made all the time to the process. And we know that it changes the product, but we don't get people to start from scratch. You do these equivalent studies, et cetera. So I think that if there is a will, and if there is better and better measurement and computational capability, the tools will begin to emerge to be able to do that, especially for a programmable molecule where everything is the same but for the code. So I would say it'll happen first with nucleic acid-based drugs, whether it's siRNA or mRNA, whatever, because the amount of change between one drug to the other is minimal compared to an antibody, let alone, an antibody, not because of the antibody, but because of the way it's made, which is different cell, different place, different everything. So I think that that is foreseeable, huge resistance. And particularly, the worst thing is in vaccines. And the reason for that, I, you know, I didn't know this stuff sitting in your seats years ago because it's not something that you get exposed to. The issue with vaccines is that you're giving it to knowably to a vast majority of people who would have never had the disease. And so the safety bar for that is gigantic, right? Because the whole Hippocratic oath, first do no harm, well, what is a vaccine? Right? I mean, at the end of the day, if it does any harm, you're giving it to somebody who may never have seen the virus. In a pandemic, that uh, uh, equilibrium changes because, or the, the balance changes because you have a much higher chance of getting it. So you can run the experiment. Absent the pandemic, something that you would have had one in 10,000 chance of getting, if I give you something that in one in 5,000 people has a side effect, all of a sudden you're gonna be worried. And so that's, I do think there's a path. I think that regulators, particularly in the UK and other places, are beginning to realize that the upside of doing this is, is actually worth somewhat of the vigilance you need. Because, by the way, just because you approve something doesn't mean you don't have to be vigilant afterwards. If you, like you may have seen yesterday, the FDA said the John, Johnson & Johnson, because of, 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 of a thrombocytopenia, they wanted to have it only used in cases where it's absolutely necessary. That's a year after. And it, the cases are very, very small number. It's not like, you know, whether it's the right decision or not, I, I'm not, I don't know. But it's not like they can't come back after and say, hey, now we have the data and it's worth doing something differently. So I think it's possible. I'm hopeful, but I worry that people will be doing it, you know, kicking and screaming. And already now, I think the FDA is massively overworked, massively overpressured, and, and you can see the effect of it. I mean, in every other f side of the FDA, there's a real kind of slowing down because they just have so much resource that's gone into this. Plus, you know, the, the size of the field is growing, the number of applications they get is growing, so it's, it's gonna take some time. It's gonna take some time. All right, kept you long enough. Thank you so much.